Up to 4% of children admitted to a hospital following trauma will have an injury to the spine. It may even be more common to see spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality, sometimes called Siwara syndrome. Most of these injuries are caused by trauma from motor vehicle crashes, falls, and sports-related injuries. Proper recognition and treatment, beginning with spinal immobilization, can help minimize the effects of spinal injury and decrease the chance of causing further injury. The term spinal immobilization, as used in this course, refers to spinal stabilization. Although the goal is to achieve 100% immobilization, in practice, this is difficult. The need for spinal immobilization is typically based on the mechanism of injury and clinical exam. Mechanisms commonly associated with neck injury are multiple system trauma, trauma to the head, neck, or torso, submersion or diving injuries, falls from a distance greater than the patient's height, and rapid acceleration or deceleration. Physical findings or circumstances commonly associated with neck injury are severe head injury, altered level of consciousness or intoxication, complaints of neck pain or tenderness, focal neurologic signs, and significant painful distracting injuries. All patients with suspected spine injury must be immobilized. In some cases, this decision will be based solely on mechanism of injury or professional judgment. Before treating the child victim of trauma, standard precautions, including gloves and eye protection, are advised for potential contact with body fluids. Hello. Please don't move. We're the paramedics. When approaching the child, speak calmly and instruct the child not to move his or her head and identify yourself as someone who is there to help. Upon initial contact with the child, the priority is to assume bimanual stabilization of the cervical spine and simultaneously open the airway if necessary. A modified jaw thrust maneuver can be used to do this. Now, we will demonstrate one technique of bimanual stabilization. Simultaneously place each palm over the child's ears with your little and ring fingers pointing toward the child's shoulders. The middle finger should be at the angle of the mandible to provide a jaw thrust if needed. The index finger should be between the lip and the mental prominence of the chin. The thumbs are placed on the cheekbones or with a smaller child on the forehead. Make sure not to put pressure on the eyes. The goal is to align the external auditory meatus that is, the ear opening with the shoulder. This aligns the cervical spine and avoids flexion of the neck. Care is taken not to tilt the head or flex the neck. A rigid cervical collar is an adjunct to cervical spine immobilization. By itself, it does not fully immobilize the cervical spine. If the patient is supine, slide the back portion of the collar behind the patient's neck. Wrap the front of the collar around the neck and secure with Velcro. A rigid, properly fitting cervical collar does limit the flexion and extension of the cervical spine. The chin must sit snugly in the chin cup, but the mandible must not be forced posteriorly, which may compromise the airway. The lower portion of the collar must rest firmly against the chest and clavicles. Several sizes are commonly available. However, if none of the commercially available collars fit a particular child, the cervical spine can be acceptably and reliably immobilized without the aid of a rigid cervical collar. This may be the case for small infants. A towel roll around the neck may be used in this circumstance. The towel roll should go behind the neck and the ends should cross over the chest. The roll must not lie across the front of the neck as airway compromise may occur. If the thickness of the towel roll is not carefully gauged, the towel roll may cause hyperextension of the cervical spine. Once the cervical spine is immobilized in a properly fitting rigid cervical collar, the child can then be placed on a spine board. The standard spine board is a non-porous board with holes in the sides for securing straps and for carrying the board. Placing a child on such a device presents a few challenges. For one, the young child's head and occiput are relatively large, which can cause the head and neck to flex forward and potentially compromise the airway and spinal cord. Some boards have a divot or scooped-out area in which the head should rest. However, 
When using a standard spine board, providers will often need to place a one-half to one-inch layer of towels or sheets on the area of the board under the young child's torso. This layer should extend from the buttocks to the shoulders, slightly elevating the torso so that the head is brought back into neutral alignment. The standard technique to move a child onto a spine board is the log roll. One provider maintains cervical spine stabilization at the head of the patient. This provider also coordinates the log roll. The child is then rolled onto her side, maintaining the spine as straight as possible. While on the side, the back is examined for injuries or palpable step-offs along the spine, and then the child is rolled back onto the board. Ready? Once Roll. the child is rolled onto the backboard, you may need to center the child on the board. To center the child, the provider with cervical spine control directs Ready? movement. Move. Movements are in an axial direction, keeping the spine aligned from head to foot. Secure the child to the board using at least three anatomic points, the shoulders, the pelvis, and the thighs, continuing to maintain bimanual cervical spine immobilization. One technique to transition from manual to strap restraints is to begin by strapping the shoulders, then the pelvis, then the thighs, leaving the head and cervical spine to be secured last. The straps at the shoulder should be placed over the shoulder girdle and not over the lower chest. This minimizes the chance that immobilization will impede chest movement and thus impede breathing. Strapping the pelvis will secure the lower torso and hips. The straps should be directly over the pelvic girdle so that the pelvis is secured evenly to the board. No pressure is applied to the abdomen since this could reduce ventilatory efficiency, worsen an existing abdominal organ injury, or increase the potential for regurgitation. Securing the thighs will prevent the child from bending the knees and thus becoming unrestrained. A towel roll can be placed under the knees for comfort. Lastly, Secure the head and neck. Multiple ways to secure the head to the board include towel rolls, blanket rolls, foam blocks, and rigid cervical collars. There are several reasons for saving head and neck immobilization until last. If the child needs to be log rolled to clear the airway, a rescuer is still maintaining cervical spine stabilization and monitoring the airway. Once the body is well secured, the cervical spine can be more easily and securely stabilized since spontaneous or iatrogenic movement of the torso is limited. Cervical immobilization devices, or CIDs, attach to the end of the spine board and provide foam blocks that surround the child's head. If CIDs are used to immobilize the head and neck, the padding under the torso may need to be higher than one inch because the head is also elevated on a foam pad. Velcro straps are then secured over the forehead and chin to hold the head in place. Sandbags or intravenous fluid bags are not recommended as head and neck immobilization devices. The weight of these objects can move the child's head during sharp vehicle turns or airway clearance procedures. It is unclear whether children at risk of spinal injury who are found in car seats should be immobilized in or extricated from the car seat. If the child requires a complete trauma assessment, intervention for breathing difficulty, or circulation management, the child should be removed from the car safety seat. If the child is still in the vehicle, the child is approached and cervical stabilization assumed by one rescuer. Oxygen administration would be provided at this time to any child who is unconscious or has respiratory distress. It has been omitted from this scenario to allow for clarity of the immobilization technique. The seat belts are removed either by unbuckling or cutting the belts. The seat is removed from the vehicle and onto a spine board while a rescuer maintains cervical spine stabilization. The seat should be tipped backward onto the spine board while one rescuer maintains cervical stabilization. Placement of one half to one inch of blanket or towels on the board for neutral positioning of the spine is recommended for the young child. Cervical stabilization is maintained as the second rescuer stabilizes the lower torso. The first rescuer calls for a coordinated long axis move onto the backboard. Particular attention must be directed to padding the body sides adequately. 
Any gaps between the child's side and the edge of the board must be filled with blankets or towel rolls prior to strapping. If these gaps are not filled, the child will slide side to side on the board during transport or transfer or when rolling the child to the side to help clear the airway during vomiting. The child is secured to the backboard and the head and neck are secured last. Alternatively, the pediatric extrication device, or KED, is placed behind the infant's head, neck, and back to provide spinal support while the child is gently transferred out of the seat in the axial direction and onto a spine board. Although cervical stabilization with a rigid collar is desirable, towel rolls or manual immobilization are also appropriate in this circumstance. When considering all issues of spinal immobilization, it is important to understand the potential risks, which include upper airway obstruction due to an incorrectly sized cervical collar or adverse flexion in infants and young children, and decreased ventilation from inappropriately placed or overly tightened straps. Other potential risks, which are extracted from limited adult data, include interference with airway access, delays in transport or physical examination, pain or pressure sores at bony points of contact, such as the occiput and lumbosacral spine, and agitation resulting in increased intracranial pressure or spinal movements despite attempts to maintain stability. Although spine injuries are uncommon in children, the potential for severe and permanent injury requires a careful approach. By understanding the unique anatomic features of children, recognizing the limitations and benefits of various types of spinal immobilization equipment, and practicing and planning correct spinal immobilization maneuvers, you can safely and effectively provide an essential component of excellent pediatric trauma care.